So welcome to this book club event with AJ Sidransky. Uh, we'll be talking today about his new book, The Interpreter. Um, just also to congratulate, the book just has been shortlisted for the Indie Book Award 2020 in the category of Best Historical Fiction by Next Generation. So congratulations, AJ. That's very exciting. And we're the first to announce it. That's also very exciting. So thank when you. I say we, um, I want to thank all the partners who came together for this event. So we have the SAJ, Judaism Stands for All, the Jewish Art Salon, the Grace Congregational Church of Harlem, and of course, Bahá'u'lláh Shon. So before we begin, just briefly to explain you how it's going to work. Um, so we have a first round of questions um, for Alan, then he will do a short reading. Um, then we have a second round and another passage of reading from his new book. Throughout the event, if you have any questions, please um, send them to Andrew. Andrew, can you just like unmute yourself and say hello so that people see you and know uh, who you are? Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm the content manager at Bahola Show. So yes, yeah, so Andrew will be um, collecting the questions throughout the event, so you can text him. We're also live streaming on Facebook, so if you any of the Facebook feeds and post a question there, Andrew will also moderate these so that we can um, make sure that we get most of the questions that we receive that you'll have at the end. Um, so with this, I think we're good to start. So my first question actually to AJ is, AJ, what's it all about? Just tell us briefly about your, your new book and the backstory. So imagine sitting opposite the incarnation of your worst fears. Now imagine that the incarnation is describing in minute detail and with great passion and pride, your own living hell. That's the predicament of Lieutenant Kurt Berlin. Kurt is a refugee from the Nazis himself. He was recruited by the OSS to translate interrogations of captured officers. As he meticulously decodes the responses of one such Nazi in real, times, in real time, he relives the details of his own persecution and harrowing escape from Europe. Before his eyes, his commanding officers develop a corrupt friendship with this SS officer. His name is von Hauptmann, recruiting him for US intelligence. Kurt feels powerless to stop them, to bring this monster to justice. When he realized von Hauptmann holds the key to the whereabouts of Elsa Graz, the girl he left behind, he hatches a plan. The question is, can Kurt's moral compass maintain its direction as Van Hauptmann's crimes are unveiled layer by layer? Um, I, I started to write, I decided to write this book when I first heard the story of my cousin's husband's escape from Europe. And uh, he, had, he and his parents, he was born in, in, in Vienna and he has, his parents escaped first to Brussels and then to, uh, uh, from Brussels to the United States on German diplomatic, forged German diplomatic passports uh, that he obtained obviously illegally. And uh, the story of their, um, the story of their escape through Nazi occupied uh, France is at sort of the heart of the backstory. Um, <clears throat> Just for, for those who are not familiar with the OSS, what, what does it stand for? Um, not everybody knows the term. The OSS was the, of, uh, the Office of uh, Special Services. It was a division of the United States intelligence, uh, military intelligence. It was sort of uh, the American MI5 or MI6, whatever that is. And uh, it was the pr predecessor of the CIA. After the war, it was renamed to be the CIA. But uh, the OSS was, uh, it, was a, it was a spy organization primarily. And so if I understand this correctly, uh, Kurt Berlin, that was also, is the real name of your relative, correct? Yes. Uh, so it's interesting because we talked about this, you and I. So um, yes, my, my cousin, my mother had a cousin, her name was Susan Reichman, and she married this guy, Kurt Berlin, and his real name was Kurt Berlin. And I don't really remember why I didn't change the name. It's an interesting question because in other books I've written that are based on true life stories, I actually did change the name. In this particular case, I decided to keep the name. And it's interesting to note that when uh, I decided that I wanted to write this, I went to visit with Curtin to interview him. And at that point, he was in his mid 80s. And he, um, he was very, very specific about what he said. He said to me that he'd be happy to talk to me and tell me his story, but that under no circumstances should I write a nonfiction work or a biography or a memoir about his life. He felt that his, uh, his experience was not unique. I feel his experience was very unique. And the one point he kept making over and over again to me was that his father 
was a very smart man. And as the story unfolded, and it does unfold in a similar fashion in the, inter in the interpreter, um, he, Hertz, Ber Hertz Berlin was a very brilliant man and managed to get himself, his wife, and his son out of Europe in one piece under very, very unique circumstances. So it's always like a challenge when you write historical fiction, you know, where does, you know, fiction begin, where does history end? Can you tell us a bit about your research, but also your writing process, just to understand a little bit how this all came together? Sure. Uh, let, let me talk about this, uh, is, the specifics of this book first, and then I'll talk a little bit about my process. So um, with this book, uh, I clearly, I knew a lot about the Nazi period, and I knew a lot about Kurt's story. And so the research that I did for this had more to do with what was actually happening in the exact time frame in which his story happened. For instance, uh, their escape occurred in October of 1940. So I really had to study everything that was going on in 1940 uh, as they traveled from um, Brussels through occupied France and then on through Spain to Portugal. Uh, so I also had to do a lot of back research because there is, you know, there, there were other back elements to the story, some of which I had to cut from the book and will be actually be in the next book called The Intern. And that has a lot to do with Hertz's backstory specifically. Uh, my writing process is that I look for uh, a, a story that's compelling. Uh, there are lots and lots of stories, but I look for something that's in some way unique. So for instance, right now, I'm working on something new. Uh, a friend of mine who was born in Cuba uh, in 1960, uh, she and her parents uh, escaped from Cuba in 1962. And they have a fascinating story. And it's interesting because it comes from the perspective of Cuban Jews. So I'm interviewing them now and I'm doing research about the Cuban Jewish community and how they responded to the uh, communist takeover in Cuba in 1960 under Castro, or 1959 actually. So um, I like to come up with a, a, something that I think is compelling first, a story that hasn't been told many, many times. And then I like to, um, then I like to do some research and then I like to start writing. My writing, um, my writing sort of technique or philosophy is that I don't outline. I know the basic story that I want to tell and I sit down and I write it from the seat of my pants. As they call that in the writing business, I'm a pantser. I'm not an outliner. And uh, the story kind of grows with me. The characters tell me the story as, as it develops. And so, um, you know, I find it to be, I find it to be a better, uh, a better way of writing because it's more natural and more organic and I'm able to become closer to the, uh, the characters. They kind of live in my head. It's very funny because I'm totally the opposite. I'm, maybe it's a German in me, but I'm very outlined. I know it's the beginning of the writing, how I end, I have the structure and then I fill it in, but it's a, it's a very different process. So I guess it, whatever you know, works best you know, for who you are is definitely uh, the way to go. Um, is Kurt Berlin, the historical Kurt Berlin, your relative still alive? No, he died a few years ago, uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a sad thing because so many people today are um, they're they're very old. They're, most of these survivors are in their nineties. Uh, they, if they're in their eighties, they're young, and their stories are disappearing. And and you know it's an interesting it's an interesting problem. Um, first of all, I feel that every single person, whether they were a survivor of a camp or a refugee, or even those, and including those who who died in the camps, each one has a in, unique and individual story. And it's very important to tell these stories because these stories are relevant to the world we live in today. We see the same kinds of things happening today that we saw happening then. I mean, one of the underlying themes in this book, as is the case in all of my work, is the issue of immigration and attitudes, American attitudes towards immigration. And sadly, you know, I started working on this book in May of 2015. So we all know what happened in June of 2015 on an elevator at Trump Tower. And so I'm researching this book and every step along the way, uh, I'm doing research, I'm writing, and then I'm turning on the news and I'm hearing the report that this guy said something that completely mirrors what, uh, you know, what something I read or learned about Hitler and, and, and the Nazis and how they seized power. So it's a pretty frightening thing. And then, you know, a couple of years later, along comes the terrible crisis at the border. And, you know, I mean, can we really call it a crisis? It was a humanitarian crisis, you know. In the 1930s, <clears throat> Jews were being, uh, 
they were being prosecuted in Germany and in Austria, specifically, because it wasn't until the beginning of the war in 1939, really, until the absorption of, uh, of Austria in 1938, and then the Czech Sudetenland a little few months later, that non-German Jews, or that were not of the nationality of the German Republic, that they, became, that they were being uh, persecuted. And <clears throat> these people were trying to escape, and nobody wanted them, and no one wanted to take them, and especially even in this country. It was viewed that these people would be a drain on our society, that they were coming here to live off of us, which was clearly not true. If we know the history of immigrants in general in this country, and we know the history of those who fled here from the Nazis. So we know that that's not true. Yet here we found ourselves in a situation a couple of years ago where people fleeing from failed states with collapsed governments that were, that were being terrorized by the equivalent of the SS, which is in many cases, they were gangs, and they, people were forced into prostitution, they're forced to commit murders, just for the sake of keeping their families alive. And so they, they came here looking for relief, looking for help to become refugees. And instead, what did we do? We put them up in camps at the border, and we took their children away from them. And please explain to me how that's any different than the stories of German Jews who crept over the borders in various countries, including Switzerland, France, Italy. You know, when my uncle was in Italy, my uncle who was the basis for forgiving Maximo Rothman, on May 11th, 1940, the Jewish refugees in Italy were told either leave the country or go into a camp. Tell me how that's different. So I see this as very, very relevant today. So I want to just like go back to, uh, to the question of fiction versus nonfiction. And uh, we, we spoke about this in preparation to this. So I felt uh, it was a weird read for me and I haven't finished the book yet, but um, I am looking forward to finishing it. But my grandfather, Kurt, uh, was also called Kurt and he was a refugee from Germany coming to Colombia. Um, so it, I felt very, you know, the whole idea of the kinder transport and so on, everything felt very close to me. So. Since your relative Kurt Berlin died, um, and with all this, I w just want to go back to the question, fiction versus nonfiction, because of course he didn't want to have it in his lifetime, but he passed away. Um, did you think about maybe doing a nonfiction book or was it clear for you to do fiction and why? Okay, so I didn't think about writing nonfiction because I write fiction. And I believe that fiction is an important way to get these stories across. So names and places and dates are important. I agree, but they're facts. The beauty of fiction is that you can connect a reader to what's going on in the character's head in a way that you can't do in nonfiction. Even in memoir, it's not the same process. In a good piece of fiction, the reader will, will they'll walk through the story with the character. You know, it's interesting, I, I also write, um, I write mystery, a murder mystery. And one of the rules of uh, detective stories is that the reader follows the detective's head. It's always third person close, and it's in the detective's head. That's how you solve the crime with the reader. Thrillers are a little different. This is a thriller. In a thrill, you can have multiple, uh, you can encounter multiple areas of thought in different characters. The point is that the reader is with the character, and they're feeling what the, real, what the reader is feeling. And not patting myself on the back, but a number of people who've read the book have said to me that in particular, the um, interrogation scenes are very uh, uh, intense. And, and the reason for that being is that they really felt like they were experiencing what Kurt was experiencing when he was hearing the answers of an SS officer talking about situations that he himself had experienced. That's why fiction. And to take that one step further, we're living in a different time. As the Holocaust uh, survivors and refugees are dying, our children and their children do not have the benefit of firsthand, uh, uh, of knowing these people firsthand. I knew many people with numbers on their arms and many people with stories and accents. My son knew a few of these people because they live to be very old, but he doesn't really have that, that same grounding. His generation doesn't have that experience. If you can tell a story in such a way that they can relate to it, it's not just facts and numbers anymore and place names and dates. It's a real experience that they can really sort of glom onto, grasp, and kind of feel with the, with the character. So I, I fully believe that um, 
fiction is, is the future for Holocaust literature, that we need to tell these stories to people who are not familiar with it. And I, and I want to specifically give you one example. So uh, my publisher, is, Black Opal Books, is based out in Oregon. And the woman who, who is the uh, editor and publisher is a really wonderful woman, and she has six children. And uh, her one of her daughters is married to a guy who she describes, you know, playfully as a redneck. And he came to, uh, to her house and he saw a copy of my book on a coffee table and he said, that looks interesting, can I take it? And she said, yes. And two weeks later, he came back and he told her that this book had changed his view of the world. Now, for me as a writer, there's nothing better I can ever hear. I may lose a fortune on this, okay? I may never make a penny on this, but I have changed someone's view of the world. And this person is now educated about something that he never would have been educated about before because he was able to relate to the character in the story. Yeah, no, and I, I see it also in the wider context of like how art reflects on history. I mean, the Jewish Art Salon is one of our, you know, um, co-sponsors for this event. And of course, you know, artists take ways, take liberties to deal with historical facts. So with this, maybe what we could do is um, hear a little bit from the book, if you uh, would read like a passage. Tell us first what, you know, where it is in the right. book, what the context, and then we're looking forward to hearing from it. All right, so this, this particular passage is about Kurt, and it's at the beginning of the book. And it's just after he arrives in Brussels. Now, he has an ulterior motive for agreeing to go back to Europe which is that he's looking for this young woman, Elsa Graz, who is the girl he left behind. Kurt walked down the steps of the Church of Our Holy Savior into the evening light. Dusk came late this time of year. He couldn't accept the implications of what Father Marcel had said. If he did, it meant Elsa was dead. The Nazis looking for Jews had blown her to bits. Kurt headed back toward his old neighborhood to walk the streets again, looking for anything or anyone that could connect him to his past and Elsa. The tram came quickly. Kurt boarded without paying. Nobody questioned uniformed Americans, ever. He rode for a few minutes, every block, every store, reminding him of something, some moment related to Elsa. After a few steps, he got off and walked. Much of the neighborhood was in ruins. The Germans hadn't surrendered an inch easily. Kurt turned into the little street where he lived with the Mandelbaums. It was deserted. He stopped in front of their building, considered ringing the bell. What was the point, though? Another family lived there now. A few days after arriving in Brussels, Kurt came here to search for them. The front door was ajar. Kurt climbed the stairs to their apartment and knocked. A woman answered. Are the Mandelbaums here, he asked, knowing full well they weren't. Who, she replied, shaking her head, her red hair wrapped in a kerchief. She didn't know anyone by that name. She, her husband and children had lived here since the fall of 1943. May I come in, Kurt asked. I used to live here before the war. The red haired woman, nodded and stepped aside, then gestured for him to enter. Kurt looked around. Some of the Mandelbaum's furniture was still there, the dining room table, the break front in the living room, the silver pieces that caught the sunlight through the cracks in the, cracks in the drapes and reflected it back into the room were gone. Kurt held his cap in his hand and fought back tears. Terrible what happened to them. The red-haired woman said, she crossed herself. You are a Jew? Kurt turned to face her. Yes, confusion spread across her face but you're American. How could you know them? I was a refugee. They protected me. I escaped in 1940. The woman turned away from Kurt. I see. It's very sad, but we didn't know. It was hard for us too. Kurt had heard this too many times. The need to explain, the need to tell everyone and anyone that there was no way they could have shielded their neighbors. Can I ask you something? Kurt said, twisting his cap in his hands. Of course, the woman replied. She reached for a pack of cigarettes from the windowsill and offered him one. No, thank you, he said. Perhaps it wouldn't be a bother if from time to time I come to see if they've returned. Here's my card. If they do, please give it to them. The woman took the card politely and placed it into the pocket of her apron. Yes, that's fine. She walked to the door and opened it. As Kurt walked past her, she touched his arm. You know the truth. No one is coming back. Thank you. Um, just want to remind everybody, so some people texted me how, where we can get the book. Actually, um, if you look in the chat, we, um, we have the links there for the book. And also, I just want to remind you again, if you have any questions, you can put the questions in the chat. Andrew is collecting them. So after um, we're done with like the, the first part of it, you know, we have it open to questions from the audience. So that's when uh, we hope to you know, get to your questions. Um, so 
AJ, so you mentioned your, uh, you know, forgiving Sirius, uh, forgiving Maxim Maximo Rothman. Yes. Um, and uh, I mentioned this to you, actually, you know, it's the whole story of Sosua has a special meaning for me because, you know, I, I, besides the part that, you know, my, my own um, grandparents were refugees who came from like German speaking countries to Colombia, but also I worked for the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, um, and I had like a lot of access to the, um, the archives of the JDC and saw the fascinating material on the whole um, Sosua. And interesting enough, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, when I worked for the Museum of Jewish Heritage, I did a private uh, research uh, on uh, the St. Louis. Uh, really? Yes, but we'll ah. talk about it some other yeah. time. But my question here, is, so both um, circles, and uh, maybe you'd speak quick, uh, briefly about the Forgiven series because not everybody's familiar with it, um, but both are shore related topics, very different. Um, but my question is, how do these books differ and what do they have in common? Okay, uh, they have a lot in common, but they're very different stories. Um, the, 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 the basic thing they have in common, and, and I'm, I'm gonna say something here that I hope no one will take any offense with in terms of books about the Holocaust. Um, what they have in common is that they're very unique stories that don't take place in concentration camps. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy in the past couple of years about several books, which it turns out, which, which are placed in concentration camps. And it turns out that there's a lot of fictionalization that goes well past where it should have. Uh, Elie Wiesel said once that um, you can't write a novel about Treblinka and a novel can't be a, a novel can't be about Treblinka, and if it's about Treblinka, it can't be a novel. As I mentioned before, it's very, the, the point of fiction is for the reader to be able to get into the head and understand the experience of the character. Um, I've tried to, uh, I've tried to present stories to people that I can tell because I'm qualified to tell the story. So I look for stories that are generally about refugees or escapes. Because my family, there were a lot of refugees and I've heard a lot about this and I understand their psyche. I would never attempt to write a scene in a concentration camp. So when I, so both of, that's what these, both these stories have in common. The other thing that they have in common is that, well, there's a few things. Another thing is that I also believe that while uh, all Jews who lived in Europe were affected by the Holocaust. We tend to focus on Jews who look a certain way, a certain type of cultural milieu being sort of the Polish shtetl look. And that's, I think, the result of the fact that movies about that period and about Jews in Europe in general tend to suffer from the fiddler on the roof uh, complex. Everybody looks like Tevye. The truth is that um, the vast majority of Jews who were affected by the Holocaust in Europe, particularly in Western and Central Europe, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, France, the Netherlands, Italy, were middle class and upper class. They were uh, educated, they spoke the language of the nation, they dressed like their neighbors, they weren't particularly religious, and one day they were no longer whatever they were. I tried to get that, ex that message across and I tried to extend that experience to my readers because I think it's important for us to understand as American Jews not to get too comfortable. And that's, you know, so that's what they have in common, both of these stories. Another thing that that's, they have in common is that I like to study the experience and idea of identity. What makes someone what they are? What makes you a Jew? So in the case of um, forgiving Maximo Rothman and the Actually, the answer to this appears in Forgiving Mariela Camacho. The protagonist, Tolia Kurchenko, who is a detective in the New York City Police Department, is the son of a Jewish father and a Gentile mother who was born in Russia and whose father was a, 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 an activist. He was a refusing. In Russia, he's a Jew. But when he, become, when he comes to the United States, he's not accepted as a Jew because his mother is not Jewish. So that creates tremendous tension and confusion for him. And it's very important in that story, he, I have to examine how he looks at himself, what he believes himself to be. He's also uh, engaged to, has a girlfriend who becomes engaged to and eventually marries to a Dominican woman 
who becomes Jewish. And she's the one who brings the Jewishness into the relationship because she wants something to hold on to. In The Interpreter, I very purposely created the character of Elsa as the child of a mixed couple, which in German, you'll correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Julian, is called Mischling. And this was a derogative term in the Nazi period. And the question there is how, why and how were, was she treated badly and how were Mischlings treated? They were not considered pure. They weren't Aryan enough. And they were allowed to function in society, but not fully. They were given some exceptions. In her case, because her father was a very vocal anti-fascist activist, and he was the kind of, he was a, a modern art, art, he was an artist who, who practiced modern art, he created modern art, which Hitler in particular despised, he was persecuted. And as a result of this, she finds out, because her Jewish family never accepted her, she finds out a week before she's sent on a train alone to Brussels that she's Jewish and being sent out of the country. So imagine the pressure of this. Imagine the, uh, the psychological uh, effect of this on her. And as a result, she, she turns to what is her identity. And her identity, and you know, without giving away too much for those of you who haven't read the book, her identity is clearly not Jewish. But the point is that, that I make in all of these stories is that identity is fluid and fragile. You choose who you are. You don't have to be what you are because you were born to that. Identity is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. You may identify with the thing that you were born as, and we'll put that in quotes, or you may choose to be something else. You know, it's interesting, the question of Jews by choice. People who become Jewish. Uh, my grandfather, who, uh, he, my grandfather, who, who, who many of these people were related to, for instance, uh, Maximo Rothman, the, the real character, Max Greenfield, was my grandfather's younger brother. My grandfather's name was Jack Greenfield. And um, he lost all but this one brother in the war. Mother, his mother, all his, his cousins. I mean, the way I frame this usually is I tell people before, in 1939, he had 66 first cousins on his mother's side. And in 1945, there were six remaining cousins. So um, he said to me once that it is our duty to accept Jews by choice with open arms, because it's one thing to be born to this. It's a whole other thing to choose it. Have I answered your question? You answered my question in way more. And I have to say, you know, when, uh, when I read the um, Forgiven series, I mean, I, I related very much to the character, you know, as someone who is, uh, secular and Jewish, um, and I love the story, you know, you mentioned your character as like a Russian speaking Jew who has a Jewish father, so his name identifies him as Jewish, but he, you know, he, he is not Jewish in America, but then his Dominican, is she a convert? I can't remember now, um, his girlfriend or partner, um, she is the one, yeah, so she's the one who wants to have a Jewish home, and the same was similar to my family, where my grandfather moved to Colombia, didn't, you know, didn't, he wanted to break with his Jewish roots um, and then married an indigenous woman who basically kept a Jewish household for a while. So it's, it's a very relatable story and it's something that actually you hardly find in fiction. Um, since we are at this and I had a few other questions that will we'll move it a bit around, I know you have a, a sample that you want to read about the Elsa character and about like her Jewish identity. So maybe we do this now and then go for the next round of questions. And again, no. any questions, you know, please send them in. Um, Andrew is collecting them and we'll have them later. Okay. Elsa explored the neighborhood. Uh, let, let me just give you, she, she's just left um, Kurt in a little park. He's gone to, to visit with his uncle who was who in Brussels, his father's younger brother, who was in Brussels when he arrived. So he hasn't seen him yet. She's left him there. They're living together with the Mandelbaums and she's on her way back to the Mandelbaums apartment. And what you should understand about the Mandelbaums is that they are an older couple who are quite religious, who are caring for both Kurt and Elsa. Elsa explored the neighborhood a little before going back to the Mandelbaum's apartment. She needed to think, to clear her head. School was fine. At least there was a little emphasis on anything Jewish. They studied the same subjects as she had at home, literature, mathematics, poetry, science, some history, and then English. Nevertheless, Elsa felt uncomfortable she never fit in. She stopped in front of a shop selling women's clothing and admired the silk, scar silk scarves in the window. 
One was particularly beautiful, featuring a modern geometrical design in blues and yellows. Elsa pictured it around her neck, clasped with her mother's turquoise brooch. In the storefront glass, she noticed the reflection of a small church across the street. Elsa crossed and stood by its steps for a moment. Slowly, she climbed to the portico. Next to the door was a bronze plaque which read, The Church of the Sisters of Charity. Entering, she took a small lace doily from the wooden box next to the door, covered her head, and dropped a few centimes into the charity box. She took a taper from the table against the wall and lit a candle, curtsying deep, then walked to the front and sat at the edge of the third pew. Two old women sat across the aisle in prayer. The church was otherwise empty. Elsa kneeled and prayed, almost inaudibly. I hope you can still hear me, even though I'm now Jewish. Please, Holy Mother, bring my parents here to me safely, please. Tears escaped her eyes. As Elsa wiped the tears away, she felt a hand rest gently on her shoulder. Good afternoon, my child, a nun said in French. Elsa looked up. The sister had the weathered face of an old woman, but the eyes of a young girl. Elsa buried her face in the nun's habit and cried. What troubles you, the sister asked. She stroked Elsa's hair. I'm alone, Elsa said, first in German and then in French. No, you're not, my child. I am. You don't understand. Elsa told the nun her story. I'm Sister Janine Joseph. What is your name? Elsa Graz. The sister dried Elsa's tears and took with the cuff of her habit. You're never alone, dear child. The Lord is always there if you seek him. Even if I'm Jewish now? Always, and for everyone and anyone. Whenever you need to feel his comfort and grace, come here, come to me. Sister, thank you. This has been so hard for me. I've never known anything but the church. These new customs, they're strange, harsh. I miss my parents. I used to go to church with my grandmother. It always made me feel safe. That's why I came in. You're always welcome here. Thank you, Elsa said. She hugged Sister Janine tightly, drew in a deep breath, and shuddered. She felt safe for the first time since she'd left her parents in Vienna. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's a very powerful scene. And um, I just want to relate to uh, what you said before. I mean, the question is, if you're today actively Jewish, I think no matter your background, you are Jew by choice because you choose to be actively Jewish. So I, I just, I'm curious about like uh, the Elsa character. Is it also based like Kurt on a historic uh, person you knew or how did you come up with her? Uh, complete fabrication. She is completely, completely fictional. So, so just to lay it out a little bit, mm. the Kurt character is actually based on two people. The real Kurt Berlin, hello, David, uh, his son-in-law is, uh, is looking at me right now. The real Kurt Berlin, who was my cousin, and he was, you know, he, he has three daughters, and uh, I'm very close to all of them. And he was actually 12 years old when they escaped, or 12 or 13, when they escaped from um, Vienna to Berlin, to, to Belgium, and then from, from Brussels uh, through to Portugal. I, w I felt the story needed to have, um, it needed to have some a romantic element because very frankly, readers like it and it sells books. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a slave to selling the books. <laughs> so I also, years ago, I was in the real estate business. I was a commercial mortgage broker and one of my uh, clients at that many, many years ago, we're talking about 35 years ago, this guy was old, he was old then, he's, he's been dead about 15 years. He was born in Vienna, he was actually born here, but his parents had come from Vienna just like right after World War I, and his, he was German speaking. And he was the person who introduced me to this whole phenomenon that the OSS had literally plucked German-speaking Jewish soldiers, the vast majority of them were actually refugees who had escaped and were in the American army at this point. And they could be anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 years old, but they needed people who spoke perfect German so that they could translate the nuance of the language that they, that they were getting from these interrogations. So I combined the two characters the two, I combined the two stories to create one character. You know, the thing is that there are, like I said, there are millions of stories and each story is valid. And people come to me all the time and they say, I have a story and I listen to the story. The problem is that most of these stories don't carry a novel. Novel has to have a certain amount of drama. It has to have a character arc. You know, it's an involved process. So in this case, these two stories worked really, really well because initially I thought about writing a, a YA book of a 12 year old, 12, 13 year old and his parents escaping. And I said to myself, not dramatic enough. So since Kurt said to me, you can use parts of my story but don't write it about me. 
I decided this was a better way. And I took the two stories and put them together. Now, the part, the portion about the, the backstory, the escape, 88% of that is true. I had to embellish a few things for drama. The story of the interrogations are true, but the love story is not. That was a complete fabrication. And I wanted to have that element, and I also wanted to make a point with that character, which is that she made this choice about choosing who she was. And now, granted, if you read the book, you'll understand that in some ways the choice was made for her by the circumstances, but that's who she was. That's who she chose to be. So that's how the character was evolved. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, the, the interpreter addresses several historical things. Um, among them, Operation Paperclip. Can you just briefly explain what Operation Paperclip was? And then sure. I get to my follow-up question, so which, which I think you know what I'm heading at. I think I do. So, uh, all right. Um, Operation Paperclip, very simply, was an attempt by the American military and government to bring uh, Nazi and former Nazi scientists to the United States to work for us on our, in our military and industrial complex and in the development of weapons. The Russians had a similar program. I'm going to ruin this. It was called Operation Osiavikum or something like that. And they did, they were able to bring some former Nazis to the Soviet Union. And to a great extent, this uh, sort of led into the arms race and the Cold War. Uh, interesting, the next book is set in the Cold War against the, um, against the execution of the Rosenbergs. So I'm not gonna tell yeah. you too much about that because I haven't finished writing it yet. Good, so um, yeah, so, so my follow-up question obviously is for those who've seen uh, Amazon Prime's Hunter show, um, because, Operation Paperclip is the subcontext to Hunters. Um, did you see the show? What do yeah. you, did you think about it? I'm not telling you my opinion yet, but I want to first hear from you. Okay, so I did watch it. Uh, my wife and I watched it, and frankly, we loved it. Um, so it's got some issues. Also there the are... ending? Because I loved it until like the last two episodes. Okay, uh, I loved it. All right. You know what? The truth is, for those of you, I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but for those of you who no have spoilers, seen it, uh, no, uh, the, the, the ending, it's not the first time somebody's used that. You and I talked about this, that there are other movies, frankly, that were a lot more serious than this kind of cartoony uh, series uh, that use the same premise. Um, I loved it because I feel that there, again, there's this big chasm that is opening wider and wider between the subject of the Holocaust and younger people. Uh, I, there, there have been a number of these articles that I've seen online about how, you know, 60 or 50 percent of people under a certain age have never heard of Auschwitz. They don't know anything about this. We need for people to understand this, not because we want tears, okay? This is not about feeling sorry for the Jews or anyone else who was murdered by the Nazis. This is about this is about a, a more general message that this can't happen. It can't happen again to anyone. It's also our responsibility to make sure it doesn't happen again. We need to stand up and be counted. You know, it's not enough to say, well, the people in power and the leadership, they thought that this was a good thing, that we needed to get these people here, even if they were Nazis. No. And we need people to understand what happened and how it happened. That complacency is what brought this about. Fascism is insidious. It's, it doesn't come in the form of a revolution. Fascism creeps up on us. And one day it's here, it bites us on the bottom and says, I'm here, and it's, then it's too late. It's a vocal small minority of people standing in front of the state house in Michigan, intimidating other people with guns and flags that say, don't tread on me. That is American fascism. And we need to be vigilant about this. And that's why it's important that the way they wrote Hunters was smart. It's written for a younger audience for them to be able to start to understand the factors involved with this story. And if they have achieved that, then I'm all for all the historical inaccuracies. I'm willing to live with that in order to get people, young people, to pay attention to the subject. I'm not going to say too much about Hunters. I mean, I liked like a lot of creative things about their storytelling, but I had my issues at the end. 
I with this, so we'll sorry. take now um, a little break in that sense that we're going to the questions submitted by the readers. So I'm um, asking Andrew to uh, tell us some of the questions he received. Please. Okay, this first question comes from Vicky, and she asks, how much did it worry you that in your book, the protagonist through his own actions was at risk of becoming as untethered from morality as his antagonist? Oh, very much so, which is why, I, if you, uh, Vicky, I don't know if you read the book, uh, but uh, you must have if you know that. Uh, so the answer is that I talk about that in the book, and, I, and he actually says that, you know, we don't want to turn into them. Uh, I think that one of the significant things about the character is that he suffers clearly from um, PTSD. This kid has been through entirely too much. He's, been sh he's, he's lived in Austria during the Anschluss. He suffered anti-Semitism there. He's shipped off to Brussels. He's lived under the Nazis in Brussels. He's had to parade around as the child of a, a German diplomat to escape. He's been sent to war by the American army. He's fighting in the Philippines. He has PTSD and he breaks, but he does realize it and he does catch himself. So yes, it was very much in the forefront of my mind and I'm very happy that you caught that. Next question. Okay, David wants to know, in writing, how do you decide the balance between dialogue and narrative? How do you know when to switch between the two? Uh, that's a great question. So um, there, thank you, David. Uh, there are uh, different approaches to this, and they are, to a great extent, the difference between literary fiction and commercial fiction. I write commercial fiction, and I'm proud of it. Um, so let's talk about, for me, I'm going to give you a really good example. Uh, my first book, Forgiving Maximo Rothman, centers around the Jewish refugee uh, settlement in Sassoon. Another author, about three years later, wrote a similar book called The Dictator. His book was considered literary fiction. Mine was considered contemporary or genre fiction. I have a lot more action and a lot more dialogue than he did. And a lot of the scenes in his book, the, 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 the narrator is looking out the window at the rain falling and he's contemplating it. It's what you as a writer want to have happen. As a reader, I want to, to hear the story. So I want to hear dialogue and I want to see the action. For me, that's why I write the way I do. And I also write kind of organically. I let the characters tell me what it is that they want to have happen in the story or what they're gonna say. And I swear to God, there are times when I'm sitting there and I'm writing and I type out a piece of dialogue or a thought and I, I, then I erase it because the, the character says to me, you know I would never say that or think that. So it's very organic. And for me, it's really about the dialogue more than anything else. Great. Uh, Fred uh, wants to. Uh, Fred says that you captured the uh, evil of the SS prisoner very well. And he wants to know how did you find that depth of hate? What is your most vivid reference for that depth of evil? Well, Fred, how are you today? So um, I see you there. So here's the answer. Um, okay. You know, sometimes I write something and then I read it and I say to myself, "Where? How did that come out of your sick mind?" I think that in terms of writing the characters as an SS guy, uh, there, there were two components. First of all, I had done so much research on all the terrible, horrible, sadistic things that these guys had done. And a lot of them were mentally ill. I mean, there's a question about it. You know, it was a rogues gallery of insane people. And so I knew that there were very, very, very minimal limits as to what they would do. And that's, there's a whole discussion in the book about executing orders versus, you know, executing um, versus, uh, you know, I ideology, you know, the ideology of the Nazis versus the excuse, well, I was following orders. Um, so it wasn't hard for me knowing who these people were to begin with to make the character ugly. I also had had the experience in, forgive me, Mariella Camacho, of writing a serial killer. And that, for a writer, or at least for this writer, was pretty terrible. I normally can write for two or three hours. And when I would write the serial killer scenes, 40 minutes and I was done for the day. Because I would read this and I'd say, I can't believe this crap came out of me. Uh, it's, it's difficult. You know, so they ask this question, you know, how does Stephen King write horror? It's there's some, there's something deep inside that has to get out. And as another friend of mine, a writer friend of mine said to me, um, 
she said, you know, when she sits down at the typewriter, it's like there's this magical connection and it just goes right out of her brain and through her fingertips into the keyboard and onto the page. It just happens. You know, uh, some of it is based on what you research and on other parts are just, you know, it just kind of comes out of you. Uh, Pastor Pierce wants to know which writer or writers influenced you the most. Oh, Nigel, a few of them. So, um, okay. Uh, I will tell you that the, the two writers that influenced me the most as a kid, actually there were three, four. Um, you, Leon Uris, uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, Herman Woke, and James Mitchell in different areas. Uh, Leon Uris in the way he told the story. Ernest Hemingway in the way that his, um, the, 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 the crispness, not just the crispness of his prose, but the economy of his prose. There's never an extra word. And I think that's really important as a writer. Michener in the breadth of the stories that he told. And Herman Woke in readability. The, the, also as storytelling. The book, the individual book that has stayed with me the longest and the most intensely, believe it or not, Dr. Zhivago by Boris Pasternak. For me, it's the gold standard of every book I've ever read. It is the most beautifully written and beautiful story I have ever read. It just, there's nothing but passion on that page. That's a real surprise um, because, again, a funny coincidence, but you know, I wrote one of my um, theses for when I studied Russian literature on Dr. Zhivago. So, um, really? And we yes, have uh, we have, have a lot of more things to talk about. Yes, so, we do. Uh, um, Andrew, how many more questions did you get? Uh, let's do uh, maybe two one more. One more, maybe. Or two oh, more. One more. Let's do two more. Let's do two okay. more. Okay. Okay. Um, Gail asked uh, some very specific questions about the book. Um, but just maybe to generalize, she said that uh, she knows that your work is based on family history. And uh, how many of the characters in the new book are based on real people or, or the incidents based on real uh, events in history? Are we talking about, we're talking about the interpreter specifically? In, in the interpreter, not, not, yes. Okay. So Kurt Berlin and um, Bertha, Ber Bertha Berlin and Hertz Berlin were real people. Sam Berlin was actually not a Berlin. He was a Rosenblatt, but that, that's a whole other story. But I, I, I changed his side of the family because I needed that. There's an offstage character, Lena, um, it's uh, Bertha's sister. She's a very interesting character. Uh, she was actually a, um, uh, she was a student of Maria Montessori, so sh she existed. Uh, part of the, Ber part of the, the 23 year old, Kurt character was based on this this client of mine. He's no longer with us. So I don't really want to mention his name. Uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Van Houtman was a creation of uh, of my you know my imagination. It was Elsa, Elsa uh, also the specific people in the involved in the OSS? I created them all. They they were not based on anybody in particular. Um, the book is far more. Um, fiction in terms of the characters than it is uh, based on real people. Um, some, you know, also there are, uh, in all my work, there are people who are composites. So, uh, and there are situations that may apply to one person that don't apply to another. So for instance, there's a, there's a whole scene where uh, Hertz Berlin goes to the, meet, the, meet von Hauptmann to get these, um, these passports. He buys the passports in von Hauptmann. And that scene didn't actually happen there. Kurt's wife, Susan, my blood cousin, her father, that actually happened when they were in Budapest on the way to get their visas. It came from it, but I, I combined it. So the, so the incident happened, but not to that person. You could do that in fiction. You couldn't do that in a, uh, in a memoir or history. Okay. Okay, and uh, one more question. This is from Robin. Uh, famous last question. She wants to know, uh, what are you working on right now? I'm working on a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, I'm working on, a, on the second book in what I expect will be a five book series called the Justice Series. And this is uh, going to be called The Intern and it's set eight years later. Kurt is a, um, uh, he, he's in 
in the summer between his second and third year at Georgetown Law School, and he has an internship with the SDNY in May of 1953, and the book happens in the four weeks leading up to the execution of the Rosenbergs, and uh, it, involves, um, it involves a murder mystery as well uh, that involves both his father's friend and his father. And there's a, what I did was I took the backstory that I wasn't able to use for Hertz Berlin from the interpreter, and I'm, I'm employing that there. And then that, that series will go out to 1973, and the last uh, book will be set against the uh, Yom Kippur War. Uh, the other things I'm working on, uh, I have an, the third part of the Forgiving series is coming out probably in January, depending on what happens with this pandemic, because I'm not going through this kind of promotional nightmare again. Um, I may have to postpone it a few months. That's called Forgiving Stephen Redmond. And for those of you who have read the first two, all the loose ends are tied up. In other words, you're finally going to find out if Carlos is Maximo's grandson. I'm um, looking forward to this, so okay. uh, yes. The other thing I'm working on is, uh, which should be coming out within the next year or so, it's really, this is a, a project from the heart, and it's a novella. And a series of six, it's going to be the six or eight short stories. They're all written already. It just depends on how long the volume will be. And it will be called uh, Becoming Bachata. And the, um, the name of the novella is The King of Arroyo Ondo. It, um, it is about life in the Dominican Republic today. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of this, I travel to the DR every year. My best friend is Dominican. And uh, he he has a house down there and I go and I stay with him for about three weeks or so every winter. And I stay with him in, in the barrio where he lives. And I have to function in Spanish for three weeks because they don't speak English in the Dominican Republic. And it's a way where it's a place where I can disconnect. And I do a lot of writing down there. A lot of my, a lot of all of my books were written down there. Uh, and it makes me understand myself and appreciate life a lot more. And so this is really an homage to, the DR to, and my friends there, and to my friend William, who really, you know, my relationship with him has been a, a sort of life-changing experience. Uh, so that's what I'm working on. And, uh, you know, I'm also, uh, you know, I, I do have a job mm -hmm. and that takes up a little time. Hello. Uh, that's what I'm doing, you know. Uh, Perfect. AJ, this was actually a perfect ending questions. And really, you speak Spanish like a Dominican. I mean, I miss us going to a Dominican restaurant. So hopefully, we'll be able to meet in person again and have some Dominican food. Um, this was fascinating. As I understand, you have a special offer for everybody, yeah. you know, the 100 plus people who were now on Zoom plus. call on Facebook. 100 plus, yeah. So um, yeah. please tell us what you, what you have as a special offer for everybody. All right, so here's the deal. Let me, let me say a couple of things. First thing I want to say is this. If you want to help me, this is what you do. And if you want to help keep the, 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 uh, the interpreter, get it off the ventilator so it's not a victim of COVID-19, read my book. First, you have to buy my book, okay? <laughs> buy the book, read the book. Then write a review on Amazon because Amazon, until you get to 50 reviews, they don't want to know anything about you. So we're going to get back to that in a minute. Then recommend the book to your friends and your family and everyone you know, but under no circumstances are you to lend the book. They have to buy another book. So here's the deal. If you go on to Amazon and you buy an electronic copy, Kindle or Kindle from your phone or iPad, which is $3.99, you buy that now and you... Um, you read it and write a review and post it before the, uh, the 31st of the month. I will give the first 20 people who do that, who can show me proof of purchase and their name on the, on, on the review, I will send you a free signed copy in paper, which is a $14.99 value. So it's a great deal. You get two for one. It's a BOGO. One paper, one deal. electronic. That's okay? a good deal. It's a good all deal. right. So thanks again to all the partners, um, the Jewish Arts along the SAJ, the Congregational Church of Harlem, and of course, Bahala Sean. This was really fascinating. AJ, most of all, thank to you. Um, good luck with this book. I, I'm in the same boat. I have a book launch right now. My book came out today. Same thing. It's a challenging time, but it's important that we are doing these things. 
uh, it was really fascinating and I'm sure we'll be back for some other conversations. Julian, if I could just add a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank you. You really, you saved my life with this and, and I, I am forever indebted and, you know, please keep me abreast of everything you're doing for your new publication so that I can help you. So that's the first thing. The other thing I want to do is I want to thank all of you for coming. And I just also want to mention, uh, you know, we're in this real mess. And if any of you have book clubs or belong to organizations that book speakers, I am happy to Zoom with you. Uh, you know, I, I would be, just let me know. You can reach me at aj at ajsidransky.com. And, uh, you know, just go to Amazon and buy it. And thank you all for coming.